Good morning, Redemption Church. It is uh, great to worship with you today. Um, if you are, are visiting, we have more information about what we're about as a church at redemptionauburn.com. And we still are trying to maintain many of our ministries, and uh, there are ways to get involved. The biggest thing is if you are a regular attender and you want more information, you're, you're looking how to get more involved, you have to be on church social. That's where our private messages go out. And so you can contact Julie Vincent about that. Uh, and she can help you. Even if you are struggling getting your information updated, contact her and she can help you do that. Our giving is still available on our app and also online. And, and you can also mail in a physical check if that's what you like to do. So thank you again for your faithfulness in that. We have um, other things. We have a, a prayer meeting on Sunday mornings that's through Zoom. And so you can get involved in that. Our, our men's book study is going on. And so you can check our, our bulletin on Church Social to get the details about that. But you want to contact Matt Sullivan. And this is a, might be a good time for you to, to get involved in that if you have more time, if you're available, and especially if you're kind of struggling with your mindset about what you should be doing, um, going through the book, knowing God is going to be pretty pretty helpful for you. Um, youth discipleship I, I, is on a break. There may be some odds and ends here that, that groups get together, but um, for the most part, we take a break during the summer. Also, um, one of the, the, the neat parts about this, if there are neat parts about um, doing kind of a virtual service, is that you probably get to see and focus on families that maybe you've seen across the room, but you don't really know. And so we're going to have a couple of different families uh, share this morning. We have the Scots doing the catechism and the Boyums doing the scripture reading. And maybe you don't know either of those families yet, but you will get to know them. And you'll get to see a little bit about their, their lives, how they're handling this time. And, but before that, um, one of the, the great ministries of our church is our, our women's Bible study. And um, they are uh, just a faithful group and committed to studying scripture. There's two of them actually going on right now. And we're gonna hear just a, a quick hello from our Thursday morning group. All right, uh, good morning, Redemption Church. So um, good Sunday morning. And uh, this is Thursday morning for the uh, Women's Bible Study, who's studying Hebrews. And um, this is, uh, we're missing some ladies that couldn't continue with us on Zoom, but, um, here we go. I'm gonna have. They're gonna have to edit that. Anyways, <laughs> we just want to hi and uh, send our love and everybody wave now. And we love you and miss you and can't wait to um, be together again. So, have a great Sunday morning. What a great group of ladies! I uh, had the privilege of of jumping in on one of the the Bible studies just to say hi. And they are a lot of fun, godly women who love to study the word and just what a, a blessing for our church to, to have them. Uh, next up, we have Scott's, the Scott's with our catechism question for the morning. Good morning. <laughs> what do we believe about the Holy Spirit? That he is God, co-eternal with the Father and the Son. John fourteen sixteen, And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be with you. Hey, church. Hi, Redemption. We're just uh, giving you guys a quick update on what's going on with the Scots, because we miss all you guys. And uh, you guys are probably doing the same stuff we're doing right now, which is... Sit at home. Yeah, we've been home. The kids and I have been home a little over six weeks. Um, I've been working from home and they've been doing their uh, schoolwork and yeah. My sewer plant schedule is one week on, two weeks off. So I've been able to do a bunch of projects around here that I've been meaning to get to. And Kids wise, they're all doing work on their computers, doing that school stuff. Ezra is playing a lot of flute, trying to make wind ensemble. Jeremy's practicing tuba so he can get into that next year. 
He had his wisdom teeth out. Jeremy had his wisdom teeth out. Yes. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, what else? Lily's been doing a lot of painting. Oh, Robin's done uh, puzzles. She, puzzles. She did a, she's doing a giant one right now. It's like 3,000 pieces, so. Mm -hmm. um, other than that, I've been missing worship at church. Like, just singing with you guys is like probably my favorite thing in the world, so. Um, I've been playing some music here with the kids and we've been singing together, which is awesome. I've been frying a lot of foods. Like, I made a blooming onion and. Yeah. Katie's been home too, she, but she's the little one. She's um, just hanging out with us. So uh, it's interesting trying to work when you've got a little one running around, but we have lots of helpers. So, so we're doing good. Yeah, I've yeah. been trying not to uh, drive my family too crazy. So just getting too impatient with me, but. He's gotten a lot of stuff done. Um, yeah, I guess that's about it. Yeah. Uh, we'll fill you in in the next chunk. We're going to cut about what I just said. What's that? I don't know, like, because we got to say the thing where we've been traveling. We can do, hey, Lil, the girls went to Paris. No, it's hot in Egypt. Don't look at that. Yeah, is that <laughs> Thank you, Scott. It's nice to see your vacation plans. <laughs> um, thank you for that. It's always a pleasure to hear how people are doing. And then now with our scripture reading, we have uh, the Boyams, a, a newer family to our church, and um, we're so grateful to have them around, and they have immediately plugged in and got, got to know people pretty quickly. So um, they are going to do our scripture reading this morning. Good morning, Redemption Church. This is Kevin and Beth Boyum coming to you from Roseville, California. We've been at Redemption since, well, regularly attending pretty much since last summer, uh, and then kind of decided to make it our church home uh, in December. We have four kids, two girls who live in Minneapolis, one Christina who graduated last year from the college there, and then Elise who's a sophomore there. We also have Joshua, who is a senior in high school, graduating within weeks, and Zachary, who's a freshman. So life here has been normal in some ways and different in other ways. Uh, I guess from a work perspective, been blessed to be able to continue having my job, and um, I actually get to go into the office some, so that's been kind of nice too. Um, let's see, what else? Josh and Christina both worked in the restaurant uh, business, so both of those are on furlough right now. So not doing that my job essentially is the same because I've been able to be at home homeschooling as our kids have grown up and with two boys still homeschooling really that hasn't changed too much aside from the fact that I now lead a group um, through an all-day zoom call a group of five students but the rest aside from them taking some music lessons and giving some music lessons on zoom has remained essentially the same mm -hmm. I guess we have kind of developed some new rhythms though um, through this this whole coronavirus thing. Um, so uh, we've added some things in. Um, well, it's you know, having Christina home has mm -hmm. kind of changed the dynamics a little bit. Um, so that's in great been, ways. Yeah, it, that's been yeah. really good. Um, so that's been fun. Um, meal wise, we've been we've split up into teams and kind of doing different meals at different times, trying out some new recipes. So uh, that's been a lot of fun. Because those recipes have included things like cinnamon raisin bread and shortbread cookies, we have tried to balance that out a little bit with getting outside, enjoying the gorgeous spring weather, biking, running, hiking. So that's been really great. Mm -hmm. um, another thing we added in was Andrew Peterson uh, is an author and songwriter and uh, has a, a series of children's books called the Wing Feather series that he did, I don't know, five to seven years ago. Uh, but he's reading those out loud, and so we've been joining in mm -hmm. on the, his nightly readings of those. Uh, and so that's been a lot of fun. We've also started some Zoom meetings, actually nightly Zoom meetings. We started about a month ago with our extended family. 
So I have family here in California. We have family in Minnesota and Virginia and Colorado and Santa Cruz who all zoom in. And so that's been really great to yeah. stay connected. Yeah. Um, and then I guess it's not new, but we're continuing to do um, on most nights kind of just a family worship time where we sing a couple songs and uh, read some scripture. And, and for this period of time, we're going through Romans 8 and, and actually working on memorizing that. Um, so it's challenging for some of us more than others, I think. Uh, but It's a great something. place to set our minds and our hearts, mm -hmm. especially in these times. Yeah. So we have some new family interests or maybe just a little bit more time for some of these things. So the boys have put in a garden. We have become a rescue family for a bird who fell out of a nest near the garden. So that's been actually really fun. Mm. Um, we've had lots of opportunity for, I would call them gospel pointing conversations with neighbors and, and other people. So that's been a delight. Yeah, mm -hmm. and even I guess on our Zoom meeting, we um, had the opportunity to go through a book that John Piper recently put out called Coronavirus and Christ. So we've been talking through that with our extended family, uh, which has been really neat. We've, we've covered one chapter so far and had some really pretty wow. amazing conversations mm -hmm. just in, in that one uh, session. So looking forward to going through the rest of that book. But it's a neat uh, book that's out there for free on Desiring God Ministries if you're interested uh, for yourself or even to go through with someone else. It really puts things in perspective. One really unique blessing for us has been that we've been having a Christmas carol sort of outreach in our community and also mm -hmm. in the Hilton's community for like seven years. And so our neighbors know the Hilton's. And so most of our neighbors not attending church regularly, it's been really fantastic to be able to invite them to the Thursday night worship nights and yeah. Sunday mornings. And some of them have stayed on and listened to the sermon. So it was just really a very natural invitation. And we know that more people are hearing um, the hope of Christ as a result of that. So that's been a delight. Another thing that, that, that I really, that all of us really enjoyed, but me especially, was the prayer and fasting day because I was able to connect with some of the ladies at Redemption. And so that was really sweet for, yeah. for me, especially not being super connected at Redemption yet. So thanks for doing that. Yeah, so thank you for the worship nights, mm -hmm. Hilton's and Pastor Josh for Sunday mornings and, and for the, the glimpse into what's going on in the building. It's yeah. fun to see the yeah. stuff taking place there and, and for the Wednesday devotionals that you started doing too. So just enjoying all of that, but we really look forward to uh, everyone being able to get back together and being able to see you and worship with everyone uh, back in person. So looking forward to when that happens. We're really looking forward to getting to know you guys better and worshiping yeah. together. So. Yeah. Have a great day. Yeah. See you guys. Okay. Our reading for this week is from Psalm 90. A prayer of Moses, the man of God. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You return man to dust and say, return, O children of man. For a thousand years in your sight are but as yesterday when it is past, or as a watch in the night. You sweep them away as with a flood. They are like a dream, like grass that is renewed in the morning. In the morning it flourishes and is renewed. In the evening it fades and withers. For we are brought to an end by your anger. By your wrath we are dismayed. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. For all our days pass away under your wrath. We bring our years to an end like a sigh. The years of our life are 70, or even by reason of strength 80, yet their span is but toil and trouble. They are soon gone and we fly away. Who considers the power of your anger and your wrath according to the fear of you? So teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. Return, O Lord, how long? Have pity on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love, that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. 
Make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us, and for as many years as we have seen evil. Let your work be shown to your servants, and your glorious power to their children. Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us, and establish the work of our hands upon us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. All right, let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you are a God who is from everlasting to everlasting, and you know everything that's going on in this world. You are in control. You hold everything together. And God, help us not to be in fear during this time, but to look to you as the author and creator of everything, the author and creator of faith and of hope. And God, I just ask that you raise in us a spirit of hope that that not only brings us into tight fellowship with you, but but goes out to our neighbors and our friends and that they can see the love that we have for each other because of the love that you have from us, have for us, and the hope that we have because of what you have done for us. Thank you for the gift of Jesus Christ for our sins and that we get to spend that eternity with you that's coming up. We look forward to that. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I just want to welcome uh, the Redemption Church of Auburn here. It's probably a surprise for you to see me uh, up here at the pulpit. It's, it's kind of a surprise to me, uh, actually. And uh, it's, uh, it's funny, you know, I thought in coming to the church with uh, nobody in it, that possibly it would be easier and I would be less nervous. But I don't know that that's actually the case. Uh, and probably because I don't care for cameras. Um, I'm of that generation, you know, we, we, we weren't taking selfies and we didn't have to see ourselves a lot. And it's, it's been funny for me to just observe my children. And uh, once in a while, my daughter Carissa, she'll kind of try and get under my skin and then she'll uh, videotape me. And, and then she'll show me the video. And of course, I'm, I'm, I'm not too happy with that uh, when she does that. But I'm not a real fond of cameras. And, and, and actually, my, my daughter Maria, when she was dating her husband, uh, she had to FaceTime with his family uh, before she ever met them. And I remember observing her on the couch speaking with Nate's family who were in Alabama, and I was so glad that I never had to do that myself. Um, and I thought she did such a great job. And uh, so it seems like maybe the younger generation are, are more camera friendly uh, than, than those of us who are a little bit older. Uh, but at, at any rate, we're all having to get used to it, right? Zooming, uh, FaceTiming, and doing all of these things is, is kind of part of our lives right now. And you know, it was interesting when Josh uh, gave his first sermon and uh, we were uh, watching him. My, my gut level feeling was that I felt sorry for him. I thought, uh, what a challenging thing. He didn't really sign up for this, uh, preaching to... Uh, his congregation when they're not here, uh, but uh, thankfully he's he's been getting been getting used to it, and there and there really has been a tremendous amount of uh, of improvement there. So so I hope that this morning that uh, this sermon is, is is profitable for you, and that the camera's not too much of a distraction uh, for me. Let me just give you a little bit of an update with regard to my own family and and how things are going. Um, we rejoice in the fact that. Uh, Maria and Nate had their first son, Paxton Lee Myers. And uh, that's kind of hard for me to say in some ways that I have a grandson uh, who's a Myers. But then as I really thought about that, I thought, you know what? I, I kind of have one up on the Myers because I doubt that uh, Pat's going to have any Thornton grandkids. So it's, it's really, a, really a, a, a great blessing to our family having another grandchild. And then uh, our son Joe and uh, his wife Danny are expecting a little girl, uh, so we're so so grateful for, uh, for for God's kindness to us. The other thing that I wanted to mention uh, this morning is is just how I ended up here. Uh, most of you know that Josh was planning a sabbatical, and this was going to be actually his first week of departure. And um, uh, Matt Sullivan put together a preaching schedule for us. We were going to preach through the book of Philippians. And uh, Matt chose the sermons that he was going to preach from, and then he left some openings for us 
Uh, he chose, of course, the good passages, the easy ones, and, and then left the remainder for us. Not really, but, but I selfishly chose uh, a passage. I chose the first one because I thought the introduction to the book of Philippians would probably be easier for me. And um, uh, lo and behold, the, the coronavirus comes. Josh is not going on the sabbatical, but he, he asked maybe for some of us to fill in a little bit uh, uh, during this time. And, and so here I am. I was the first on the schedule, so he asked if I would, I would uh, preach this morning. And uh, we're not going to be going through the book of Philippians. And as, as Josh sees fit, he's probably going to ask some others to preach from the, uh, from the book of Psalms. So um, I'm going to uh, choose this morning Psalm 90 and, and, and go through that with you. Now, Psalm 90 is, is, is really an intriguing psalm. It almost appears as if Moses wrote this psalm during three different time periods or three different frames of mind. He starts with the incredible statement uh, that, that the Lord has been our dwelling place throughout all generations. Uh, before the mountains were born or you brought forth the whole world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Uh, it's just an incredible statement. As Moses reflects upon life, he says, you know, one of the stabilities for me is that God has been my dwelling place. God has been my strength. But then right after he mentions that, he, he, he seems to go into a very dark place. He, he mentions things that are sometimes hard for us to, to, to even read, right? He says in verse 3, you turn people back to the dust, saying, return to the dust, you mortals. So, so it seems like there's a change there. And then when Moses, uh, Moses finishes the psalm, he finishes on the very positive note, may the favor of the Lord our God rest upon us. So I hope this morning that we can kind of see what was Moses thinking when he penned this psalm? Why does he have these, these, these contrasting things, these, these amazing statements, as well as these difficult statements? And, and, and I hope you can get a handle on that. And, I, and I'm hoping that if you have a Bible, that, that you put it in front of you. Um, I know for me, in, in, sometimes in, in watching the sermons, I, I can just get a little bit too relaxed at home and maybe be doing other things. But I think if, if you're going to benefit from the, the, the study this morning, it would be good to, to have Psalm 90 before you um, as we go through it. So I want to look at it under three basic heads. First of all, God, the dwelling place for believers. And secondly, the earth is not a safe dwelling place for believers. And then thirdly, God gives wisdom for our temporal dwelling places. So first of all, God, the dwelling place for the believer. And I think it's good for us to think a little bit about dwelling places and our temporal dwelling places and, 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 and what we enjoy about them. You know, most of us, I would say, would, would consider our dwelling place our home, right? We purchase a home, we, uh, and we begin to make it our own. We, we begin to make those changes, right? Um, I can remember when we first bought our property, and uh, it, it, it needed a lot of work, and uh, there was a lot of thistle growing all over. The, the, the road going into it was all dirt. The homes weren't in very good shape, and... Um, we, we needed to make this a dwelling place, a place where we would enjoy, right? And I can remember that my father-in-law came out from Montana to visit us. And uh, we were sitting on, on an old dilapidated deck. Um, the plumbing was backed up. And I can remember him looking at me and, uh, and saying, why did you buy this place? Because from his vantage point, this was not a suitable dwelling place for his daughter and for his grandchildren. And I tried to convince him that uh, it would be eventually, you know, we wanted to make some changes and it would be a, a safe, enjoyable place to be. And, and at the time he had a hard time seeing that. But when we buy homes, we like to make them suitable to be a good dwelling place, a place that we go to work, we come home, and, and, and they, it gives us a sense of peace, a sense of enjoyment, and a sense of stability. And, uh, and that's, what, that's what we think of when we think of dwelling places. Um, it's interesting, I've been looking at homes with, my, with one of my sons, and as we go into these homes, I reflected upon the fact that, that at one time, this was the dwelling place for someone. And this one home we went into, we went out into the garage, 
And as men, we always look at the garage and, and in the garage, I was picturing a man working in the projects that he had done. And uh, um, this man was no longer living. He had died and there was also a, a plaque there with, with his uh, medals from, I believe it was World War II. So here this man had been in the war. He came home, probably got married, had children and established this dwelling place for him and his family. And, uh, and now he's gone. And now a, a, a new person is coming in and, 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 and taking over and, 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 and gonna probably change things. And, 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 and that's how dwelling places are for the most part. They're temporal, but they're important and we like them and enjoy them. And they kind of make, they, they make sense to us in life. Well, Moses, as he reflects upon a dwelling place, he says, you know, the bottom line for me is God is my dwelling place. And not only is God my dwelling place, but God has been the dwelling place throughout all generations. And you know, that's encouraging for us to think about, isn't it? That when we think of all the generations that have lived upon this earth and have passed, Moses says, you know, the one stable thing that we can think about is that God has been a dwelling place for his people. And not only has he been a dwelling place for his people in generations past, but in all the future generations to come, he'll be a dwelling place. He'll be that, that stable place where people can find comfort and peace and enjoyment and, and, and relaxation. And you know, it's interesting as we think of Moses himself and the life that Moses lived, think about it for a moment. At the outset of Moses' life, he was ripped from the dwelling place that should have been his, right? His parents had to hide him and they hid him for three months in fear of Pharaoh because Pharaoh wanted to kill all the children his age. And, and after they couldn't hide him anymore, they, they put him in a basket, put him in a river. And of course, Moses was adopted by the princess of Egypt and he was raised there in Egypt. And we might think, well, you know what? That was, that was a suitable dwelling place for Moses. But actually, I think if we could ask Moses, what was it like growing up in Egypt? Was it a great dwelling place for you? He would actually say it wasn't. Egypt had a lot of difficulties for Moses. So many difficulties that it came to the point where it said that Moses refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. And not that he didn't appreciate what she had done for him, but, be, but because of the atmosphere of Egypt and all that it brought. Hebrews tells us that he chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. You see, it, it wasn't a great dwelling place for Moses because of, of the affliction that he saw uh, Pharaoh uh, putting upon the, 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 the people of God there. And, and I don't know that we know all the ways that Moses was mistreated there, all the ways in which he found that a difficult place to be raised and all the things that came his way. But it got to the point, of course, that Moses fled Egypt and he ended up in Midian. And there in Midian, Moses found for himself um, a wife. He, he found for himself, uh, uh, he had children there. And I believe if we could ask Moses, Moses, what was your favorite dwelling place upon the earth? Moses would have said, my favorite dwelling place upon the earth was definitely Midian. I think he might say that because there in Midian, he enjoyed his family. He enjoyed shepherding. He enjoyed the lifestyle there. And, uh, and of course, we know that God had better or bigger plans for Moses. And he came and he called him. He said, Moses, I want you to leave. I want you to leave Midian take your family, and, and, and I want you to go and deliver my people um, uh, from the Egyptian oppression. And Moses was not thrilled with that, wasn't real excited about that. As a matter of fact, he told God, you know, you know, Lord, that, that's just not for me. I'd rather just stay basically in the dwelling place that I already have. And, and God said, no, Moses, I'm, I'm going to uproot you here, and I'm going to call you to, to, to a bigger calling. So Moses reluctantly went. He goes to Egypt, he delivers the people, and brings them into the wilderness. Now, obviously, the wilderness was not a, was not a great dwelling place for someone to, to, to live, right? 
Not to mention the fact that Moses had the Israelites there who weren't happy with being there. They were disappointed that he'd even brought them there and wished that they could be back in Egypt. So Moses had to deal with all the complaining, all the sinning that took place. And, uh, and it got so bad that God said, you know what? That entire generation that left Egypt, they're not going to enter the promised land. They're going to die in the wilderness. Pretty difficult place, right, for someone to dwell. And then God told Moses himself, you know, Moses, because you didn't treat me as holy before the people, right? You remember that Moses struck the rock and angry. He was so angry at the people. And God said, because you didn't treat me as holy before them, you're not going to get to enter the dwelling place. Or the, I'm sorry, the, the promised land. So Moses had to lead them for 40 years in the wilderness, see the promised land from afar, and never enter it himself. Now that could have produced bitterness in a man's heart, right? A man who was happy uh, living in Midian, and, and, and yet God uprooted him, brings him into the wilderness. And yet Mo Moses did not die a bitter man. Moses was a man who dwelt with God. And, and, and from his perspective, in many ways, had a fantastic life. And he had a fantastic life because he had this mindset that God was his dwelling. God was his stability. God was the one that he was to find um, joy in and purpose in. And, uh, and so I, 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 I'm going to encourage us to keep this in mind now. God is our dwelling place. As, as we go through this psalm, because Moses is going to go from mentioning how amazing it is to have God as our dwelling place to the second point that we're going to look at. The earth is not a safe dwelling place. The earth is not a safe dwelling place. And Moses is going to give us several reasons why the earth is not a safe dwelling place. And the first one is this. It doesn't end well for us on this earth. It doesn't end well. He says in verse 3, you turn people back to the dust, saying, return to the dust, you mortals. Interesting that he uses that language, return to the dust. Um, you know, there's that, there's that song that says that all we are is dust in the wind. You've probably heard that song. Um, is that what Moses is saying, is all, all we are is dust in the wind? The wind comes up and blows some dust, and boom, it settles, and that's, that's all our lives really consist of? That's not at all what Moses is saying, really. As a matter of fact, when he uses this language that all we are is dust, or the, I'm sorry, uh, when he says that return to the dust, he's really bringing up the language of, uh, of Genesis, right? We know that God created man out of the dust of the ground. But when you read that account, you really find the intimacy in which God created man. He created him from the dust of the ground, but the Bible tells us he breathed life into him, right? This intimate relationship. And he created man from the dust of the ground. He created him, him in his own image and then placed man at the top of creation, right? He gave him dominion over the whole earth. And God communed with man and fellowshiped with him and had that interaction. And, and, and God really, in that sense, was the dwelling place for man. So something terrible has happened, right, in this world for God to take the, high, the highest thing in his creation and say, return to the dust, return to the dust. You know, I'm sure that some of us have been to funerals and uh, grave sites. One of the most sobering things to me is when they lower the coffin in the ground and they start throwing dirt on it, right? It's so sobering. It's so final, right? And so on this earth, things don't end well for us, right? That's something that Moses says you, you, need, you need to consider. We will return to the dust. But the second thing that he mentions is that the, the glory of life fades. We see this in verse 5. Yet you sweep people away in the sleep of death. They are like the new grass of the morning. In the morning it springs up new, but by evening it is dried and withered. Now we live in a, in a good area to relate to this analogy. Um, we're just coming out of the season where everything is so nice and green. You know, it, it, it's incredible if you drive up Highway 49, all of the grassy hills and, and, and just how beautiful they are. 
but you give it a couple weeks with the sun penetrating and you drive in those same areas and they look completely the opposite. You're going, what happened to this place, right? Realtors actually call this sucker season because if somebody buys a home in the country during this time of year and they don't realize what's coming, a lot of times they're disappointed. So Moses is saying that the luster of life, it dries up, right? And that's true for all of us. You know, some of you have probably seen uh, before and after pictures, you know, uh, sometimes they've come up on my phone where they'll, they'll show an actress from years ago and they'll say, you, you want to see what this actress or, or this actor looks like now? And they'll show you both pictures. And isn't it sad when you see that? Um, and that's probably why I don't like cameras that much anymore because I'm kind of in the after mode, right? I'm getting to that point. But, but life's luster, it dwindles down very quickly. My son Philip was telling me that that guys that become professional gamers and, and they'll game for 12 to 14 hours a day, they get so good at it, they become professional. He said by the time they get to their 30s, they begin to drop off and the, and, and, and the younger kids uh, are better and so they can't continue in that field. Isn't that incredible? That even by the time you're, you're 30 years old, your, your abilities are starting to dwindle in that area. Well, Moses says, that's another reason why this world is really not a safe dwelling place for us, is that the glory of life fades. But then he also says that life is short. He says in verse 10, our days may come to 70 years or 80 if our strength endures. 70 or 80 years, that is a short life, right? And some people, of course, even have a shorter life. You know, my daughter Carissa was uh, sharing with me how she's so disappointed that she never got to meet either of her grandfathers. You know, you think about that for a moment, that just in a few generations that she never got to meet my dad or my wife's dad. That's pretty sad, isn't it? You know, and, and you know, there was a time we lived longer, right? There was a time that, that, that people lived all the way past the age of 900 years. Now that seems incredible to us, 900 years? I mean, can you imagine your children and grandchildren and great children the, and the army as it were that you could have, right? So 900 years seems like a lot to us, but I'm sure at the time, at the time it didn't really feel that way to them. Life even then probably seemed short. So Mo Moses says that God has cut life short and then the fourth thing that he mentions is that life is filled with trouble. In verse 10, our days may come to 70 years or 80 years if our strength endures, yet the best of them is but trouble and sorrow. You know, it would be one thing if Moses said, you know, life is short, but it's incredible, right? Life is short, but at least we don't have many problems in life or difficulties in life. But you know, the fact is life is filled with problems. And if you're like me, sometimes you feel like maybe the next chapter in life won't have as many problems. You know, a lot of young people start off and, they, and they're single and they're thinking, man, when I get married, then my problems will be reduced, right? And then they get married and they find actually maybe they've increased a little bit. Well, when we have children, that's going to be amazing, right? And it is amazing, but with those children come problems and difficulties and trouble. And so Moses says that this is another reason why we ought not see this as our permanent dwelling place. But fifthly, he also adds that God is angry. We read this in verse 7. We are consumed by your anger and terrified by your indignation. You know, the reason for all of the other things that we've just mentioned is really due to the fact that God is angry. Moses says in this psalm, that he has placed our sins and our secret sins before him. And he's not happy. He's not happy with what's happened to this world. You know, it's interesting when we think of the anger of God, it seems like that's the one thing that the modern mind doesn't al allow God to have, right? God shouldn't be angry. And uh, sometimes when, when national 
or global problems happen like we're seeing today, right? Where many people are, are, are dying of this coronavirus or suffering because of it. Um, people will uh, sometimes call for pastors, right? They, they wanna kinda call, kinda call God on the carpet and say, okay, what's going on here, right? And the last pastors will say, can you explain to us that this loving God that you, that you speak about, uh, what's he doing? Why is he allowing this? And I think it would be interesting, and maybe some pastors have said this, but if they were to, were, were to respond by saying, you know, God is not happy with, with the way things are going on on this earth. And a matter of fact, he's angry. He's angry at what's happened in this world. And, uh, and, and somehow that's, that's not always acceptable to us. But I think that we can certainly relate to it, can't we? You know, we're, 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 we're doing a remodel in the church here, and thankfully people have been uh, coming and donating their time and, and doing a really good job. But if someone were to come into this church after uh, Michael Carp and some others have, have come in to do this rebuilding, and they took a sledgehammer and just destroyed all the work that was being done, I'm sure if the men who have been doing that work came and they observed it, they would be rightfully angry. And so God is as well. God looks at this world, this world that he created perfectly, this world that was, was, was good. And, and when you read the, the creation account, he repeats that, how good this world was, right? And he sees what sin has done. He sees, he sees what's happening in the lives of people, right? And even, even in this virus, it's so sad, isn't it? When we find that, that, that people who are being stuck home a little bit more, and the, the anger and the irritation and all the things that are going along with that. Well, see, when God sees that people he would create in his image to love one another and enjoy one another, have such a difficulty getting along. So God observes all of the sin of the world and, and, he, and, he, and he's angry about that. He's angry that his good work has been so messed up. But you know, the other thing that Moses says about the anger of God in this psalm is that we can never fully understand God's anger. He says in verse 11, if only we knew the power of your anger, your wrath is as great as the fear that is your due. If only we knew the power of your anger. You know, we, we really will never be able to understand why it is that God is angry with the world as, he, as it is. And one of the reasons that we won't ever understand that is because we don't have a hatred for sin like God does. And we don't have a hatred for the consequences of sin as he does. And I'm not saying we don't hate any sins or the consequences of them, we do, right? But we don't tend to hate the sin in our own lives as we should. We tend to hate the sins that other people are, are, are committing. And, 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 and we tend to let the ones in our lives uh, slip by. But in this Psalm, Moses says, you know what? God sets before him, and they come before him, our sins and our secret sins. He sees the sins of the heart, and he sees what is done to us as image bearers. And, 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 and so there's a hatred there. But, but, but what I want to challenge you this morning is, if, if you reject God because you don't feel like he has the right to be angry, that you would really take Moses' word to heart, that we can't fully comprehend his anger. We can't really enter into that. We can understand an aspect of it, but we'll never fully comprehend it. Just like we really don't fully comprehend many of the attributes of God. And uh, so, so, so we ought to trust him in these things. Okay, so we've seen then that God is the dwelling place for the believer. We've seen that this earth really isn't a safe dwelling place. But then thirdly, God gives wisdom for our temporal dwelling place. And that's what we're going to close with this, this morning. Notice it with you, me the, the first uh, point under this is Moses says we need to number our days. He says in verse 12, teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. So if we're going to have wisdom in this life, in the temporal dwellings that we have, Moses says we ought to ask God to teach us to number our days. You know, which is interesting, isn't it? Because some people might read 
the dark things that he's mentioned about life being short, uh, you know, about the luster of life declining, and, and conclude, well, then what's the use, right? What purpose does it all have? But Moses doesn't conclude that in this psalm. Actually, he says that life is so precious, and because our time is short, that we need to pray that God teaches us to number our days, right? And, and I think what he's driving at is that we begin to appreciate each day as God has given it to us, no matter what that day brings. You know, uh, one of the things that my family and I have done is we've gone to national parks and we, we live in an incredible country, don't we? With national parks that are absolutely so beautiful. And uh, I'm, I'm so appreciative of my wife because um, when we come into these national parks, my tendency is just to set up camp and, and, and enjoy the camp setting, the fire, ride bikes around the campground. But my wife is much better at thinking through our time and she'll say, you know what, we have three days here. And so she gets their brochures and she highlights all the things that she wants us to do and see so that when we leave there, we can go, man, we really got a great sense of what that park was like. Well, that's what Moses wants us to do in life. Moses wants us to get a sense of the precious value and the time that we do have. And so if we're going to live in these temporal dwellings that God has given us, we need to pray that God would teach us to, 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 to number our days. But then also he says that we need to know something, secondly, of the compassion of God. And this is in verse 13. Relent, O Lord, how long will it be? Have compassion on your servants. Well, that's quite incredible, isn't it? That we would know something of the compassion of God. The Bible says that the judgment of God is his strange work. It's the work that he really doesn't necessarily want to do. But in terms of the compassion of God, the Bible is filled with countless stories of how God delights in forgiving. He delights in receiving back uh, people to himself, right? Uh, one, of, one of my favorite stories is, is the story of the prodigal son, right? Showing the compassion of a father uh, to a rebellious son uh, who squandered his life, who squandered his goods. But the father's love and longing for the son to return. Well, well the Bible is filled with passages that would have us know of the compassion of God. So even though our sins and our secret sins are set before God, and even though there's consequences for those things, it's the heart of God to show compassion on his people and to give to them forgiveness. So not only does Moses say, you know, Lord, we need to learn to number our days to see the value and how precious life is. He also says we need to truly know of the compassion of God and what he delights in, but also that we would daily realize his unfailing love in verse 14, satisfy us in the morning with your unfailing love that we may sing for joy and be glad all of our days. Isn't it incredible that Moses puts a verse like this in the midst of this psalm that faces so many difficult things, that we would have joy, that we would uh, be satisfied with the unfailing love of God. And I think that that's the thing that I really want us to take from this psalm that we can face the most difficult things in this life, the brevity of life, the fact that we're returning to the dust and the luster of life declines. We can take all of these things and yet we can know of the unfailing love of God. You see, those two things don't contradict themselves and we tend to think that they do. But to know for certain that God loves us every day right? This is a daily thing. And, and you know, I'm not very good at this, to be honest with you. I tend to get in my routines. I tend to just go to work and do my thing. And I don't really reflect enough upon how much God loves me and how his love will never fail us, right? That's, that's just, we, we could spend a sermon speaking about that, that God's love never, never fails. And he can take us back no matter what we've done. And he still loves us. And we need to think about that on a daily basis if we're going to live in this temporal dwelling, the earth as it is, and, 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 and walk with God. But then he also mentions joy in the midst 
of affliction. Verse 15, make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us. Now that's, that's not a prayer that I would naturally have. Make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us. See, my prayers are more, Lord, I can be glad when the afflictions are gone. Remove the afflictions and then I'll have some joy. But Moses doesn't pray that. Make us glad with as many days as you have afflicted us. You know, that, that, that's an incredible thing that we can have joy in the midst of difficulties. And, and, and not that this has necessarily been my experience. As a matter of fact, I, I found in life, I'm, I'm a little bit ashamed at times of the little bit of afflictions that I've faced and how it's kind of robbed me of, of, of my joy. But when we think of Moses and we think of his life, think of all of the things that this man had to watch and observe. The plagues in Egypt and all of the difficulties that that brought with it. Bringing the people of Israel into the wilderness, seeing the deaths of an entire generation, the affliction of that. And yet in the midst of all of that, Moses didn't cease to th see God as one who forgives, one who has compassion. He didn't cease to think of life, hey, this is, a, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. No, Moses said, if, if we're going to dwell upon this, this earth, we need to pray that in the midst of affliction, in the midst of difficulties, that we would still be glad in our God, knowing his love, knowing his kindness to us. But also, also, um, he mentions uh, in the fifthly, knowing uh, the deeds of God and his amazing splendor. Verse 16, may your deeds be shown to your servants and your splendor to their children. And once again, brother, that's so incredible to me that Moses brings up the deeds of God in the midst of these difficulties. So even when we're facing a pandemic like we are, can we see the deeds of God? Can we see the kindness of God? Isn't it incredible when you see the way people go after um, cures for these things, right? All of the medical help that's given, that God in his mercy, even though, even though we've seen that, 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 that life is, is short, even though um, th there's an element of God's anger being displayed in, in these difficulties, it doesn't mean that God has ceased to work, and it doesn't mean that God doesn't work through people to relieve these difficulties. So Moses wants us to see, remember the deeds of God. Moses had to learn that in the wilderness. Even though that generation of people that wouldn't enter the promised land, he could see God working in the lives of people, right? Who knows how many of those people, right, entered the eternal promised land, even though they didn't enter the temporal one, because they came to know the compassion of God and the unfailing love of God. Moses saw God working. He saw the deeds of God as being displayed and we ought to see the same as well. But also the splendor of God, he mentions. You know, I'm so grateful that even though this world has fallen, even though my life is going to be short, right? Even though its, it's, it's, it's luster is fading, I'm so thankful that God didn't remove the splendor of this world. I'm so thankful that I can still go outside and observe his creation and be moved by how incredible he is, right? It, 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 it's, it's one of the gifts that he really didn't take away from us in, in, in this temporal dwelling place. He still allows us to, to, to be in awe of, 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 a, of a sunset or a sunrise or of, of, of the mountains and waterfalls and the splendor that is here. And it, it's always been here. And I'm so grateful that we can observe it. And Moses is recommending to us Lord, and to our children, know the splendor of God in the things that he has made and the things that he has created. But also he mentions here, living with the favor of God resting upon us. Notice verse 17, may the favor of the Lord our God rest on us. You know, that's an interesting statement, isn't it? Having God's favor rest upon us. We might relate to this a little bit um, when we think of, ch of, 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 of parents and children, you know, it's pretty sad when sometimes you see that a parent, uh, a child goes through living life 
and, and not sensing his parents' favor. So trying to always gain that favor, trying to always live up to something uh, that would make them acceptable before their parents. And, and Moses doesn't want us to live that way. He doesn't want us to be insecure about our relationship with God. As a matter of fact, he wants us to live our lives knowing the favor of God upon us, knowing that God is for us, right? And once again, it's so incredible that all of this is couched in this psalm. These difficult things that we look at, these difficult things that we face, it doesn't in any way take away from God's favor upon us, his delight in us, and that he's for us. And that's another thing that we need to take to heart as, as we dwell in, these, in this temporal uh, world, in the temporal dwelling. But also, he mentions, and pray that God would establish um, the work of our hands. Yes, establish, he repeats it, establish the work of our hands. You know, the, the, the fact of the matter is, we're going to spend most of our waking hours working, right? That's, that's just the way life is. And, uh, and, and, and Moses says, you know, we want to have a sense and we, uh, of accomplishment with uh, the work of our hands. We want God blessing that. We want God behind that. And, and once again, I would invite you, whatever, whatever jobs that you're doing, you know, there's mom at, moms at home teaching their children, trying to train their children in the way of the Lord. And, and they're praying, Lord, bless the work of our hands. There's dads that are out there in the, in the work world um, trying to make an income and, and say, Lord, bless the work of my hands. And, and I would invite you, bring God into the workplace with you and, and ask him to bless the things that you're doing uh, and, 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 and ask him to, to, to show you that he's blessing the things that you're doing. See, sometimes one of our, our difficulties is we divorce God from our everyday life. But Moses says, you know what? We have these hands, right? These hands that work, these hands that do things. And we ask God, you know, bless it. And then when he does, we can give thanks to him. I think I've mentioned before uh, in, in preaching that one of the things that I've tried to do at my work is to practice giving thanks when when God blesses my labors, right? Instead of assuming that everything should go good, right? Saying, Lord, thank you that after I worked on that motor that it actually runs, right? Instead of, instead of thinking, oh, you know what? I've been doing this for a while. I'm good at this. No, Lord, bless the work of my hands. Thank you that you gave me that ability to do that. Because ultimately our, 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 our lives are sustained by him. And, 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 and we want to see the, the blessing of our work coming from him. And so I hope, I hope this is helpful. I know there's been a lot from this psalm as, as, as we've taken it up. And I would encourage you to, to, to read through it and, and maybe consider it in the light of the way um, it's been laid out. Or maybe you'll consider a different way. But, but ultimately, God is our dwelling place. God is the one that we find our stability that we find comfort and strength and purpose in. And then he gives us these temporal dwelling places, right? But they're temporal and, and they come with difficulty and trouble and, and some problems. But then Moses gives us these keys, right? Knowing the unfailing love of God, knowing the compassion of God, knowing the favor of God resting upon us. And all of these things ought to encourage us with, with, with the lives that we have. So uh, thank you, thank you for, for hearing me this morning. And I hope it's encouraging to you. So, so let's pray together. Um, our Father, we're so grateful for your word. And we are especially grateful that you created us, that we might dwell with you. And we know that this world and its brokenness has, has severed some of that. But by faith, Lord, we can trust that you are our dwelling place, that you are the one that we can find strength and comfort and encouragement from. And we're so thankful, Lord, that you've given us the tools to face the difficult things in this life, that even though our lives are short, even though our lives have problems, Lord God, that we can have joy and gladness because of your unfailing love. And we pray, Lord, that we would not see these things as contradicting themselves, but that we might see that even though you're a just God, and even though you do punish sin, that you are gracious and compassionate and you love when people return to you. Lord, we pray that you would help us in these things, 
and strengthen us as we traffic through this world. Give us thankful hearts, we ask in Christ's name. Amen.